Welcome to this week's Thinking Podcast. I'm excited to have Dr. Kevin Poe, who's one of the leading thought leaders in, uh, in, in medicine. His blog, KevinMD.com, has been cited as one of the most you know, must-follow blogs by top publications. So excited to have a practicing doctor and uh, someone that's you know, taste-making a little bit of what uh, medicine is going to look like join us today. Uh, so welcome, Kevin. Glad to have you on with us t today. All right. Well, thanks for having me. It's great to be on. So I think uh, just from a, a high level, um, I, I'm just curious from a personal background story. I mean, I think most doctors go into medicine, um, you know, wanting to help patients. Um, you've definitely sure. taken a little bit more scale where you're not just helping patients one on one or within the hospital context, but building one of the the largest, uh, you know medical blogs uh, out there, kevinmd.com. So I'd love to sure. hear your personal story of how you're scaling your medical knowledge. Yeah, so one of the reasons why I went into medicine, like you said, really was to give patients a voice because whenever patients go to the hospital or whenever they see me, they're at their most vulnerable and they need a voice through our dysfunctional healthcare system. Now, I've been practicing medicine for about 15 years now and I think that time I realized that doctors also need a voice because doctors, as you may have heard, they have to deal with the increasing amount of bureaucratic paperwork. They have to deal with these antiquated electronic medical record systems, antiquated technology. And there's a lot of obstruction when it comes to physicians caring for patients. And doctors also need a voice. And that's why I started my own site at kevinmd.com because as a blog, um, not only it's my voice, but I also share thousands of other physician right. voices, patient voices, other clinician voices. And it's important that they share their story and let the public know what's going on behind closed doors. Because a lot of times people and patient, uh, other patients, they don't know what uh, some of the obstacles that we face are when we try to treat them. So it's important to have this platform where we can share our story and I started Kevin MD back in 2004. Not so much um, that I had a plan at the very beginning, but uh, really it's blossomed to a place where these thousands of healthcare voices can share their stories and really give a behind the scenes look at how healthcare is really being practiced today. And hopefully, if patients and the public know some of the issues that we're dealing with, we can go one step further in trying to fix these problems of better care for patients. Have a real dial. Exactly. I think, um, you know, especially when I, I know when I was growing up, um, you would look at your doctor as like an unfailing authority figure. And I think that, you know, it, it, oftentimes they are the expert in the room. But, you know, I think I think everyone's a person too, right? Like I think people realize that as um, we understand. And, and I think just medical information is getting put more and more distributed with sure. the internet that, um, you know, people are coming in with more of an opinion. People are coming in with, you know, expecting a higher level of explanation than perhaps like, Hey, just do ABC and uh, we'll check in a year from now. Um, yeah, I think that there's definitely been an evolution in terms of the doctor patient right. relationship where you said back then the, uh, relationship was more what we call paternalistic, right? It was more authoritarian, right. whatever the doctor says goes. Now the relationship has evolved. As you said, patients right. have so much more medical information at their fingertips. And when they come to my exam room, I think it's definitely more of a partnership where the patient, of course, right. has final say. And really as physicians, we serve as their guides through this uh, healthcare system. Because sometimes even though patients have all this knowledge at their fingertips, sometimes they don't know how to interpret it. They don't have the medical background to interpret right. all that information that they find on Dr. Google, for instance. So right. I think it's the job of physicians really to help patients and um, guide them through this this morass of information that they're finding online. Yeah, no, that's interesting. I'm, I want to be devil's advocate here. So I think more old school doctors or approach would be like, hey, um, are, are biohackers, are people taking medical biometrics into their own hand, sort of like wanting to take their own tests? Is that too risky? Is that just letting people run amok in already a very expensive healthcare system? I'm curious, um, you know, it, it, what, what is the balance there? 
Yeah, I think uh, you bring up a fantastic point. I think that with more power also comes more, you know, more responsibility, right. as they said in, in some movies, right? So I think that, yeah, patients have all these tools that are available to them. Um, they have genetic tests. They can order their own lab tests. But really, there are repercussions to all of these tests. When patients order tests, they may not know the the fact that it comes with what's called false positives. It could be it could necessitate even more tests, and that could even lead to more costs and uh, and repercussions to the patients. Right. So I think you know I talk to doctors all the time, and a lot of doctors are scared by this new wave of patient empowerment. Right. And I think that this is just the world that we live in. Patients are going to have access to this technology they're going to have access to this information so it's up to us to really help guide them and interpret them and let them know the benefits and risks of their decision because just because you have more information um, doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to get better health care so i think it's really up to us as physicians to redefine our role yep. whereas before we're the gatekeepers of information i always reframe us now we're the curators of that information we need to really be guides to patients and um, not necessarily forbid them from using this technology but we need to uh, help them use it in a responsible Absolutely. way I think it's very refreshing because i think that you can't fight historical trends right like the internet enabled the mass distribution of information and i think it's it would be silly to imagine hey we're gonna like not let you know if you look across like all domains you know priests and rabbis were the gatekeepers to god you had yeah. um you know like, like uh, I guess, computer scientists, gatekeepers between your, your mobile phone and, 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 and computing. And I think you see the same thing happening in, in the field of medicine. Um, oh, absolutely. So, and if you look, like you said, if you look at other fields, right. um, you know, the consumer has so much power now. Right. You know, you look at, you know, Amazon ratings, you look at TripAdvisor, you look at Yelp. And I think that the consumer has so much power. And I always say that, um you take trends in other industries and you apply it to healthcare and you'll always be ahead of the curve right. because healthcare is always three to five years behind what people are doing in Silicon Valley. Not even slower, yeah. if not even slower. No, it's not even slower. It's like sometimes they don't even adopt it at all, <laughs> right? right? There's, just, there's so much friction when it comes to healthcare. I hear so many stories of startups that, you know, they want to disrupt healthcare. And, you know, part of me just, you know, not just laughs, but part of me just uh, makes me wonder, you know, do they realize a lot of the inertia, a lot of the friction that they are dealing with in our healthcare system because there are so many attempts to disrupt the healthcare system and all of them, not all of them, but the majority of them, they don't make that much of an impact and it just really goes to show how slow moving our healthcare system really is. But that being said, I do think that there is change but really we can't expect it to be as quick as it is in other industries. Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, it like it's one of the most important problems that we should be face talking about as a as a country as a society like 30% of our government spending our tax revenues are for healthcare so yeah. i mean it obviously sounds like there's efforts from startups or internally within practicing uh, practitioners i mean in your opinion you know what are the highest leverage ways that are, are will be working like what kind of you know, what levers should one be thinking about to, to optimize the system, right? I think you have Obamacare that might be repealed. You have Trump care that's kind of fuzzy. I'm curious, like, you know, zoom back to 2017, like what is the lay of the land in terms of the medical landscape from your perspective? Yeah. So, you know, I could take that question so many different ways, right? So I'm an internal medicine physician, so I practice primary care. So I see, um, you know, I'm in a group of four other internal medicine doctors, and I see patients four days a week. So I'm going to tackle this from a primary care standpoint. So I think that the biggest problem that I face as a physician is really spending enough time with patients. Right. I don't think time is valued enough. Because if you have so many regulations from the government and insurance companies that take away from our time or make us do other things that's not related to patient care, whether it's filling out paperwork, whether it's forcing us to use these antiquated electronic medical record systems and, and it, uh, monetary incentives really just to churn through and see more patients. Right. And I think all of those things take away from the time that we spend with patients. And I think really that's the biggest problem that we face as primary care physicians is that we simply aren't incentivized to spend time with patients. Right. And that's really what we need. 
not only spending time face to face with them in the exam room, but also spending time to think through their problems. Right. I see patients and they have, you know, five, ten different issues that they're that, that they have to deal with in a single visit. And I only have fifteen minutes to spend with them. And that's really not appropriate or proper patient care. Right. So I think And that's because the insurance uh, insurance or hospital, basically the hospital either pays you per patient or insurance pays you per script or something, right? Like you get the bill per per test, right? Yeah. There are different types of compensation right. systems, but I think the majority of compensation systems have some type of what's called a productivity component where that where physicians are incentivized to really to see more patients. If, if a doctor sees more patients in a given day, right. they're going to be paid more by the insurance companies and government, and, and I simply don't think that's right. Yeah, I mean, you, you think of it as like a factory system, right? Like how fast can these laborers make new iPhones? And if you make more iPhones, which is like treating patients, then you get the reward, right? It's like essentially, essentially it's like a factory model to, to healthcare. Yeah, and uh, I think that you know you see a lot of doctors who are burning out because of it. Um, you know, the suicide rate in physicians are is, is certainly yeah. rising, yeah. and really the joy of medicine is 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 really decreasing. And I think that if uh, people come and read my site, I share a lot of stories of doctors who are getting burnt out by by you know the churn and the conveyor belt model right. that we have for healthcare. And I think that these are certainly issues that need to be. Uh, better articulated in in the, in the public, right. and these are stories that I like to share on my site because they aren't often publicized on on newspapers and other mainstream media outlets. Yeah, no, I think that's like it ends up being an incentives problem. I think when my, my personal discussions with the various doctors it seems like it aligns very clearly with with what you're what you're saying here. Um, but how do you attack uh, the insurance, pharma, like syndicate, right? Like. How do we, like, what would be the right route? Or, or is it like, do we just give up, right? Like, it just seems like, okay, this is some crazy monolith where these are multi-billion, trillion-dollar entities sure. that have been, have, like, octopus fingers in every single 50 states. Like, like is that just setting up your own clinic where you're doing more concierge medicine type uh like, like what, what, what are the approaches here to, to resolve? Yeah, I think that's certainly one approach. Um, so I think that there is a movement, what's called direct pay primary care. Um, it's not so much concierge, but, you know, you think of concierge, you pay like, you know, two, three thousand dollars a year. Right. But you have what's called direct pay where you pay an annual membership of less than five hundred dollars and you get access to a primary care doctor who bills you directly without any third-party payers like the government or insurance companies. And I have a lot of stories on my site for doctors who are just purely fed up with the system and they've gone with this direct care route. So they are operating outside the system. And I think that um, this is certainly a growing trend. Um, so but the patients have to pay out of pocket? That being said, the patients do have to pay um, out of pocket. But like I said, it's... Uh, it, you know, it's, it's 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 almost a nominal fee. You know, we're not talking about thousands of dollars. Right. We're talking about maybe hundreds of dollars, and um, you know, a lot of their primary care needs are, are are covered by that. And I think that 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 that's a certainly an interesting model that a lot of doctors are resorting to because they're just just fed up with this the system. Now, that's still re a relatively niche market. Market, you know, I'm not, you know, we're not seeing a stampede of doctors who are leaving primary care and and going to direct care. But I think that um, the fact that this is growing really is a a, a commentary on on how fed up physicians are in, in, in the current system. Are politicians addressing it properly? I mean, you had you had like Obamacare. Now you have Trump coming in with yeah. I think rollback. I think my I, I'm just my curious. Simple answer, yeah. yeah, my simple answer is no. <laughs> They're not right, so I think that a lot of um, you know the politicians they are influenced by by a lot of special interests. You know, obviously the insurance, um, the insurance company uh, that's a, that's a big special interest right. that they have to count how to. Um, and if you look at the politicians, I think that the um, that the needs and views of the practicing clinician really aren't properly represented in Washington D.C. You look at the stereotype of a physician, right? You think, oh, you know, this is a rich doctor. Powerful, you know, yeah. what is they have to complain right. about? You know, you're in one percent, right? You know, what do you have to complain about? And um, so, as physicians, I, I don't think that there's a lot of 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 sympathy from the decision makers mm -hmm. in Washington D.C. and and the other healthcare entities. So, I think that it's important that, um, and one of the things that I try to do on my side is that we need to frame our problems through a patient care lens because. Um, I mentioned before that 
the biggest issue that I have is primary care is that it's just simply not spending enough time with patients. And I think that if physicians were incentivized to spend time with patients rather than churning out more patients a day um, and really show that that benefits patients, not only by spending more time with them, by thinking through their problems and improving their care, through that approach and through that reframing, can we institute some change um, uh, we can institute change by the decision yeah. makers. So every f- issue that physicians have, whether it's time spent with patients or malpractice, it needs to be framed through a patient care lens. Right. Yeah, no, uh, that's cool. I mean, also, I think just from talking about incentives, um, yeah, I, I, I think, you know, pra- you know, doctors get paid or, you know, one can make money off of prescription drugs. And I think oftentimes prescription drugs are good for certain use ca- for, for a lot of use cases, obviously. Um, but it just seems like, you know, one of a big component of, you know, our community is a lot of, uh, you know, tens of thousands of us do intermittent fasting. And there are people, you know, in that community that have done a combination of fasting and a low carb, high fat diet and have like gone from a hundred insulin units a day to zero. Uh, I'm curious to, you know, is that something that, you know, more doctors are looking at, like sort of outside, because uh, it's interesting. I've also talked to a lot of, you know, internal medicine specialists where like, you know, that is not against, that is not like the board, you know, certified way to treat diet, type 2 diabetes. But like, it just like, just from an N equals, you know, case study perspective, like people are losing weight. They're like not, you know, they're, they're. H one A, you know, is the, the, their blood glucose is going down. Uh, like, sure, I'm curious sure. if, if any personal experience with that, or like looking at diet or lifestyle as a as an intervention, as opposed to you know focusing on prescription drugs. Yeah, so I think that absolutely, you know, specifically with diabetes, you know, lifestyle always comes first. Right. You, know, uh, you know, speaking for myself, and actually for a lot of physicians, you know, I, I I'm loathe to prescribe medications. <laughs> you know, that's all really yeah, that's the last here. resort. Yeah. And um, you know, when it comes to losing weight. You know, whether it's like these, uh, um, you know, high protein, low carb diets, you know, I think there have been studies showing that it doesn't really matter what the method is as long as, um, you know, in diabetic specs, uh, type 2 diabetes specifically, if they do lose the weight, no matter what the method is, that is going to be beneficial, right. you know. Um, I think that we do need to embrace a more multidisciplinary, more team based approach when it comes to approaching these issues. Whereas in the past, physicians used to work in silos you know, by themselves. I think that there are a lot, of, um, in, uh, a lot of initiatives right now where we're promoting more of a team-based mm-hmm. approach. There's what's called a patient-centered medical home, which is an initiative from um, a lot of our primary care organizations that um, not only do I see patients you know, one-on-one day exam room, but I have a whole team behind me. You know, I have a dietitian. I have a diabetes educator. I have a pharmacist where we can really kind of approach these patients holistically. So we do have a long way to go, but I think that what you are saying in terms of emphasizing wellness and emphasizing lifestyle changes and exercises, I think we are taking small steps, um, you know, at least me specifically, right. you know, we're taking small steps uh, towards that goal rather than reflexively prescribing a medication first. I think it's like, it's interesting because I feel like, like a lot of the like, doctors I talk to give pretty uh, sort of, I don't know if it's a conservative or just pretty balanced recommendations where you have more yeah. uh, biohackery sort of casual, you know, you know, not medically trained folks, but like, you know, clearly extreme in some way, just offering very extreme advice. I, sure. I, I'm curious, why do you think that is? I mean, I think is that because of a, a conservative approach to, uh, to, 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 to suggesting protocols or is like actually the, the science, the data is best for some, some of these more balanced approaches to lifestyle? Yeah. So I think that a lot of physicians, we, you know, we always talk about what's called evidence-based medicine. Right. So something that needs to be studied in, you know, randomized double-blind right. trials. So you mentioned, you know, in terms of like the low protein diet, you mentioned like, you know, and a one and a zero, right. it worked for one person. You know, I think a lot of doctors shy away from that anecdote-based medicine. So, I think that's why we are so conservative is that, you know, we may hear it from a patient where it works well, but we need to see it in a double blind randomized control study. Yeah. And sometimes it'll take years to perform. Yeah. Um, so to my knowledge, uh, when, you know, when it comes to some of the more exotic diets, you know, I feel I have to certainly, you know, brush up on my, my evidence, right. but 
there isn't uh, a specific exotic diet that, that, that's better than the other. I think that right now, um, if you look at some of the data, is as, as long as you do lose the weight and and you know keep a certain BMI, you know these are all things that are helpful. And uh, I think that's really one of the reasons why physicians are right. so conservative. We always wait for that New England Journal of Medicine study before we before we act, and sometimes. It'll take years to perform. I'm, I'm curious. When you, I know you're also just a prolific speaker, going out to different medical conferences. I mean, what you know, what resonates with folks there? I mean, it sounds like, uh, you know, these are all other smart doctors. Like, what, what, are, what, you know, what, what are the key sticking points that you know resonates with 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 your audience there? So, I'm known as as uh, you know what's called social media's leading physician voice. You know, I've been involved in social media since 2004. Mm-hmm. Not only with my blog at kevinmd.com, but also on Facebook and Twitter. And a lot of doctors, they don't really see the positive aspects of social media. Whenever they hear about social media, it's really from a risk manager or a lawyer, <laughs> or they read it in a newspaper. Yeah. They say, you know, these doctors are fired because they took pictures on Instagram of, of surgeries and you know, people <laughs> in the ER. Right. And so whenever I talk to doctors, it's always they always hear about social media from a perspective of risk or from a negative perspective. Right. So when I go to medical conferences, I really just share my story. I, I let them know about how we can use social media to educate patients, how we can use social media to define our online reputations because, of course, patients are Googling doctors. Right. And perhaps most important, I always say how social media can make our voices heard because we talked about earlier. we talked earlier about how physicians need to have their voice heard because we need to have input in how our healthcare system is changing. And I think social media is a great way to share right. our stories. So the issue that resonates most with, most with physicians is really um, articulating how social media can be used from a more positive aspect. And I share stories from my social media journey since 2004, and I share stories from other successful social media doctors. And it really turns on a lot of light bulbs because a lot of doctors I talk to, they don't really see, they don't really hear stories of how social media is being used by successful physicians. They they hear it from their risk managers. And, um, you know, I talk to a lot of doctors. They say, you know, I started a blog because of you. I started to go on Twitter because of you. And, you know, I certainly don't expect every doctor to jump on social media like I do. But if I could just get them thinking about how they can use these tools. And, and as you know, and your audience knows, you know, social media, these are powerful tools that, that, that we didn't have. Yeah, it's baked into ago. like our fabric of communication. Exactly. It's like, you're, you're, know, very, you're very much it's left. A base, it's basic. Yeah. It's basic communication yeah. now, especially uh, you know, especially uh, you know, in Silicon Valley, you know, where, you know, and uh, in the West Coast where you guys right. are, you know, it's, it's it's really a basic form of communication. But believe it or not, in in healthcare and in medicine in particular, um, physicians are very slow to adopt social media. Right. So um, when I talk to them, you know, they I really try to get them thinking about how they can use social media to enhance their professional life. Right. If there was president poe and you're like gonna or dictator poe you could you could just ma- wave a magic wand and the healthcare system would look like what you want it to look like could you give me a sense of what I, i'm curious like what would be like the ideal system then uh you know it, well, at least what characteristics what would it look like yeah you have uh you, you always have these um you know the debate, right? Really, is healthcare a right or is healthcare a privilege, right? right? So you, know, you have the conservative and progressive view of healthcare. So I think that you want to look at what other countries in the world are doing. So for those who think healthcare is a right, you could have a a single payer government healthcare system, kind of like a Medicaid for all. Um, for those so who think healthcare government pays for every, everyone, and just the, the yeah, government for the government pays for all the prices. government pays for, and then they dictate all the prices. Right. And you have kind of a minimum level of health insurance. And if you look at, I think, the United Kingdom, you have Australia, you have kind of this basic Medicaid for all where the government provides kind of minimal services. And then for those people who think healthcare is a privilege, then you could you could graft onto that some type of private healthcare system right. for people who are willing to pay more for more enhanced services. And this is really the system that you find in, in other other places in the world. So you have a little bit of both. Right. So in the United States, you know, you have like really a mishmash of of health insurance. You know, you have private health insurers, you have Medicaid for the poor, you have Medicare for the elderly. Um, some of it is government run, uh-huh. and some of it isn't. Right. And so I think that you have this confusing amalgamation of of health of, of of all these different types of fragmented health plans. So if I was running it, I would just have at least a unified 
um, government run system just to kind of cover minimal services. But then on top of that, you have a more private system for people who are willing to pay more kind of a public private hybrid. And then this is essentially what you have in, in different parts of the world. And, and, <laughs> and, yeah, and you make it work. sound so simple. It sounds like, okay. And it sounds very r rational for most people, right? Like, okay, you have some baseline where people aren't just dying on the street and then, you know, for more enhanced services. I mean, it's like funny that like, we somehow can't compromise to get to what seems like a common sense solution. Yeah, no, I think that um, the issue is really taxes. And, you know, if you compare taxes, America, uh, United States compared to the rest of the world, we pay relatively Low. fewer yeah. taxes compared to the rest of the world. Yeah. So if you are going to have that baseline, taxes are going to go up, right? But the, People but the baseline always is already ask, happening you know, now with like, like Affordable Care Act, right? Like everyone's sort of supposed to be mandated to have health insurance. Yeah, but it's not really. I think the Affordable Care Act really just um, entrenches the the private insurers. Okay. So you know, it, that's it's much different from having a I see. a I kind see. of like government a, like a public, run Medicaid yeah, for public like a single public payer. System. Just so, it basically just jams down prices. Exactly, right? and we still have you know we I think the Affordable Care Act just really um, enforces the employer. Um, based health insurance. So a lot of you know the majority of countries still gets their right. health insurance through their employer. And if you're not employed, yeah, yeah like if for, you're not employed, then us. you have to go yeah. to like you know company, the yeah. the yeah. the healthcare healthcare.gov, right, the marketplaces. So um, right. I think there are a lot of trade-offs. You know, you see a lot of surveys where people um, ask, you know, are you in are you in favor of a single player health plan? And of course, the majority says yes. But then they never ask the follow-up questions. Are you willing to pay higher taxes for a single-payer healthcare system? I think the answer will be different, right? So um, I think American society as a whole, there's a lot less, um, um, I guess, social responsibility. You know, I think that you have the stereotype of the rugged individualist in the United States, and you don't have that in other countries. Um, other countries have more social solidarity than we do in the United States. That's why I think it's very difficult to move forward with type of with some type of uh, of baseline government run single payer. Wouldn't system. the argument be that once you have a single payer, the government can just jam down drug costs? But then I guess on the yeah. drug company side, they're like, hey, it costs so much to get a drug through, so we need to make all our money back. Yeah. And then you look at the special interests about, you know, obviously hospitals and, and drug companies, you know, they're going to fight this tooth and nail and you know how powerful their lobbies are, right? So I think that you have those entrenched special interests who are going to be against a single payer. So if you look at how difficult it was to push through the Affordable Care Act, and the Affordable Care Act is a relatively moderate, um, you know, it really just entrenches the status quo right. almost. Um, and it was pushed through with a, a Democratic president, and Congress, and it was so difficult to push through, you know, anything more than that, I think it'd be, it'd be tremendously difficult. Yeah. So I think it's just a reality of our political system, the reality of our society that's preventing us from, from getting wholesale healthcare changes. Yeah, yeah I mean, that reminds me, because I feel like a lot of aspiring doctors want to be doctors because of the stereotypes of, hey, it's well-respected, pays well, and you're going to be an important person. I think that's very much different from what you want an actual doctor to be like, right? You want a, a doctor that's not doing it for money or fame or, or power. It's yeah. more like, hey, I want to help people. And I think uh, to your point, you, you go through four years of medical school, you do a few years of residency, you're seven, eight years invested into this. Now you're, you know, and it's not necessarily glamorous. Like, though, you know, when you're a resident, you know, working, you know, 20 hour shifts or whatnot, I can see why you're like, oh, holy crap. Like, did I just like mess up my life decision making? Like, does that seem to be common? I mean, I, I, that's a, a, sort of my perception from the outside. For a lot of people, just hit a reality check where it's like, whoa. Yeah. They have to go in with their eyes open. Yeah. So I think they need to go into medicine for the right, obviously, for the right reasons. Um, it's always cliche to say, you know, you want to go in to help people. Right. But I think if you want to go into medicine for status and money, you need to, you know, you go to Wall Street because medicine is <laughs> really not for you, right? Because uh, especially now these days, there's just so many. Um, you know, there's just so much bureaucracy and there's just so many, so much friction when it comes to um, treating patients. You have to go into medicine for the right reasons. Um, and, um, you know, that's all I can say about that because, uh, you know, I talk to a lot of medical students and, yeah. you know, they read my site and, um, you know, it gives them a, a real dose of, uh, uh, you know, a real strong reality check. And, um, you know, not to say that, you know, 
I would do it all over again. I, you know, I, I really enjoy what I do. Right. You know, not only seeing patients, but I enjoy the social media aspect of it. I enjoy kind of uh, you know pushing the boundary aspect of of what I do on Kevin MD. So I think for me, I have a pretty good blend of the traditional medicine where I see patients, but also the social media aspect, the online reputation aspect, right. the coaching aspect where I teach doctors about social media. So these are things that. Um, aren't taught in medical school and residency. So I think that having that balance where you not only see patients, but also where I um, do these other social media related things with my medical degree, I think that's been tremendously rewarding. Yeah, no, that's interesting. Like, do you think that this should be just a part of the standard pro like curriculum? Because I, I think I heard from one of some of my doctor friends that like there's only four hours of nutrition in medical school. I mean, very little about, I guess, social media, which is not now a very important, I guess, tool and, and practice. I mean, I, I guess, would you think that in, you know, five, 10 years, we have like Kevin Poe's curriculum, just like a, a mainstay in, in, in medical yeah. school? It stands well, to I reason, think it's, you know. I don't know if it's amazing, but I think it should be an elective, right? right? So um, I think that there's tremendous power to building a platform. Um, you know, I think that you know you have speaking, writing, social media, and if doctors want any type of influence, and not necessarily, you know, wanting to be famous, uh, but I think that if doctors want a platform where they want to educate patients and really have some type of influence i think utilizing these tools are is, is tremendously important you know doctors need to know how to speak doctors need to know how to build an online right. platform doctors need to use um, social media not you know to, to promote themselves but really just to spread reputable health information right. and you know if, if you could find a way to really to use these platforms to spread good health information, I think that's tremendously powerful. And I think that these are skills that um, definitely are tremendously important, uh, you know, for every physician to have. Yeah, no, I completely agree with that. I mean, I'm, I'm happy that we have forward thinking physicians like yourself, you know, you know, flying the flag of being thoughtful of how we should evolve our healthcare system as well as how people should communicate and, and build a build a voice. Um, thank you for your time. I'm gonna give you the last word here. Um, but other than that, um, it was a great conversation here. Oh, yeah. Well, thank you again for uh, having me on. So I think that, um, you know, I think uh, I wanted to just to circle back to what I said earlier about how important it is for not only physicians, but patients as well to really share their voice. I think that doctors and patients, we need to come together because even though sometimes doctors and patients are viewed in opposition to each other, we're really on the same side. Right. So I think um, one of the more gratifying things that I've seen on my own site is that doctors share their stories, patients share their stories, and it's through these shared perspectives that we can come together. And only when we come together can we really change a healthcare system. Because when you have doctors and patients on the same side, um, looking and, and doing things for the same goal, I think that's that can create powerful change. So I uh, definitely encourage more physicians, more patients to share their story and um, hopefully come together so we can change our healthcare system for the better. Well said, well said. All right, thanks, Kevin. Appreciate the time. All right, thanks for having me on. Yeah, cheers. Cool. That was a fun conversation with Dr. Poe. Uh, I think it's always fascinating to talk to practicing physicians. As we know, healthcare today is a crazy, murky ecosystem and, and having a forward-thinking a uh, thoughtful doctor, you know, cutting through it is is, is obviously awesome. As, and I think his words, patient and doctor on the same team, uh, really resonated with me. Uh, so I think that is a good take-home point there. So as always, you can find us on Apple iTunes, SoundCloud, YouTube, and Google Play. Uh, stay tuned for next week's episode. We'll have another great conversation. See you later, thinkers. Bye.